Better? Oh, wow. OK. All right. OK. Um, all right. So thank you all for coming back to be tortured for another 90 minutes. Um, so we left off just with this notion that there is a weak version of the hierarchy problem that has nothing to do with divergences, just has to do with physical mass thresholds uh, that we can see for scalars. Because in the example we wrote down, there was no manifest symmetry of the scalar when we took its mass to 0. And the same problem didn't exist for the fermion because the fermion was protected by chiral symmetry. So what's the point of all of this? Well, if we just have the Higgs in the standard model, of course, the fermions, you know, the fields in the standard model don't cause any big problem, right? The, the finite correction from, say, the top quark in the standard model is not that big, right? The top quark is not that much heavier than the Higgs. And if it has a threshold correction that's suppressed by a loop factor, that's really not a problem at all. So if we just restricted ourselves always to the field content of the standard model, we would never, at the level of those finite corrections, appear to have a problem. Okay. But certainly something should make you a little uncomfortable, which is that we already know, and you've heard you know, in the lectures in the first part of the summer school, uh, we know, you know there's neutrinos, neutrino masses. Uh, we have pretty good evidence there's dark matter. We've already discussed there's at least suggestive evidence for gauge coupling unification. All of these things would amount to extensions of the standard model that would involve additional new fields, and they would involve those fields in particular would have masses that are of the order of the mass scale wherever the interesting thing happens. So uh, in the example of unification, what happens is uh, you unify all of the gauge couplings um, in the standard model at some very high scale, and you unify the Higgs doublets into some larger representation of your unified symmetry. And what that now gives you is it now gives you interesting diagrams. So all of the extra particles that appear in your unified theory are showing up at whatever point the, the couplings unify. So in particular, if we naively run up the standard model gauge couplings, that happens around 10 to the 15 or 10 to the 16 GeV. So that tells us the mass scale of the extra particles associated with uh, unification is around that scale. And then we get diagrams like this, where you have the Higgs, and then there's a loop, for example, of a heavy gauge boson that forms part of the unified gauge group. And whatever heavy scalar pairs up with the Higgs to form some multiplet of the unified symmetry. So these are new finite corrections of the Higgs mass. Uh, and they go like you know, the gauge coupling around the scale of unification. There's a loop factor. And then they're proportional. The finite piece is proportional to the mass scale of these particles. right? So that's a, an enormous contribution to uh, the Higgs mass. In fact, it's not surprising some of the first indications of uh, naturalness or the existence of a hierarchy problem in the standard model actually came from thinking about theories of grand unification, that it turned out always to be very, very hard to get a scalar that was very much lighter than the scale of all the unified particles. And this is one reason why that's true. Okay, So if you want to believe in unification at a much higher scale, which is very suggestive, you immediately have to confront this very large finite correction to the Higgs mass. Similarly, neutrinos, right? So you've now heard, hopefully, about different mechanisms for generating neutrino masses. Uh, one possibility is, of course, if you have a seesaw mechanism for neutrinos, uh, or one in which you know, there's a right-handed neutrino that couples to the lepton doublets and the Higgs, and then has a large Majorana mass and gets integrated out to generate the Majorana neutrino masses, then at least in the UV theory, right, there's some diagram that involves the Yukawa coupling between a right-handed neutrino and the left-handed lepton doublets, those things talk to the Higgs. Now, if these right-handed neutrinos are very high, if they're up at the seesaw scale, right, so if they're at 10 to the 13 GeV or so, uh, that mass scale dominates this loop. And so you, again, get some enormous contribution, finite contribution to the Higgs mass, just coming from whatever uh, physics fixed up uh, your neutrino masses. Now, here, of course, this contribution is proportional to these Yukawa couplings, so you can play a little bit of a game to make this threshold correction smaller. But if you know these couplings are order one and you have a genuine seesaw, this is, again, some enormous finite contribution to your Higgs mass. OK. So things you want to believe are true of the standard model as we go to higher and higher energies, gauge coupling unification, the existence of neutrino masses, they give you finite corrections to the Higgs mass, which can be very, very large. OK. Nothing to do with quadratic divergences, right? No, no problem computing these things and believing in them, and they're large. Uh, finally, another good example is dark matter. OK, so we know, of course, there are lots of possibilities for what dark matter could be. But a favored candidate is it's some new set of degrees of freedom uh, that carry some electroweak quantum numbers uh, that set their uh, relic abundance. And if you have dark matter consists of something that it lives in some new electroweak multiplets, 
Then there are interesting two-loop corrections to the Higgs mass, right? The two-loop corrections come from the Higgs going along, collecting, connecting to electroweak gauge bosons, which then connect to loops of these new fields. And that, those give us also finite corrections to the Higgs mass, which go like a two-loop uh, correction. There's some threshold effects that depend on the relative mass scales of the dark matter relative to uh, standard model gauge bosons. But those are also, again, proportional to the masses of the dark matter. So if dark matter is particularly heavy, right, then here's another situation where a two-loop correction gives you a contribution to the Higgs mass. And even that, right, even dark matter that doesn't even have a direct coupling to the Higgs, but talks to it indirectly through electroweak interactions, gives you a finite correction. Okay, so this shouldn't make you panic, right? You could certainly believe that none of these things cause a problem. Maybe there is no gauge coupling unification. That's just all a lie that we tell ourselves to sleep better at night. Right, so maybe there's no unification, that's not a problem. Maybe the physics of neutrino masses is explained down at the TeV scale. So maybe the corrections coming from those physics, that physics has a small scale to it, maybe that's not a big deal. And maybe dark matter is light enough uh, that, that this threshold correction is not so bad. So you could believe that these finite corrections exist, but maybe they don't cause a huge problem because the scales work out to be not that far from the weak scale. The problem is you still have to think about what a theory of quantum gravity might also do. Now, this gets a lot thornier because, of course, we don't have a genuinely complete theory of quantum gravity in which we can match in a perfect way between that description of quantum gravity uh, and the low energy description of the standard model. So while we do have string theory, and string theory is a favored uh, candidate for a theory of quantum gravity, there are no known examples where we fully stabilize all moduli, everything perfectly so that everything is calculable and finite and get the standard model out. There's no example of that that is truly genuinely complete. So we can't do this exact calculation, but we can see some of the interesting effects that should come around from any uh, particular UV completion of a theory of quantum gravity. So um, just to show you or to argue for what the effects might be that we would worry about, Let's just consider a toy model. It's not a theory of quantum gravity. But let's just imagine that there are some new heavy states that live whose masses are on the Planck scale that are associated with whatever physics gives us the completion of quantum gravity. So you could think of these as being heavy string states or some other uh, heavy degrees of freedom corresponding to quantum gravity becoming strong. Okay. So you can ask, if I have these new heavy states whose mass are on the Planck scale, let's call it a fermion for simplicity. If I have a new fermion whose mass is the Planck scale, uh, it's just associated with quantum gravity. It doesn't have any direct couplings to the Higgs. It just talks to the Higgs through gravitons, right? Normal, unexciting, massless spin two gravitons. So I can still calculate, although the theory, my theory of quantum gravity is becoming strongly coupled at the Planck scale, I can still calculate, for example, loop corrections to the Higgs coming through uh, loops of gravitons using my effective field theory of quantum gravity, which is a good effective field theory at energies lower than the Planck scale. Okay, so if I have this heavy new fermion whose mass is order the Planck scale, I can ask, all right, what's the finite threshold correction to the Higgs mass coming through this diagram where gravitons connect to this loop of a heavy fermion, connect to the Higgs, that should give me a finite threshold correction. Okay, so I sit down, I do this calculation, the, the twiddle, of course, is a sign that I didn't actually do this calculation. But um, you sit down, you do the calculation, and what do you get? Well, you get that the correction of the Higgs mass is proportional to you know, four powers of the Fermion mass, but it's over four powers of the Planck scale from the couplings. So this could be an order one number. And then you get that the actual dimensionful scale that appears here is the Higgs mass itself. Ah, that's not so bad, right? That tells me quantum gravity appears to give a correction to the Higgs mass that's actually proportional to the Higgs mass itself. Okay, the reason for that um, is actually sort of interesting. So, you know, the graviton coupling to a massless on-shell particle vanishes at zero momentum. Um, so the coupling at the end of the day in this diagram has to be proportional to the mass of the particle. And so that means in particular, so, you know, that means that the, the, the proportionality is coming, again, from the coupling of the graviton to the actual mass of the Higgs, and that's what saturates the uh, dimensionful parameters here in this loop. So that's why, at the end of the day, it's proportional to the Higgs mass squared. Okay, because the Higgs is on shell, the graviton coupling is coupling to the Higgs. So this wouldn't seem to be so bad, all right? So maybe we'd say, great, all right, this is sort of a toy model for Planck scale effects, just talking to us through normal gravity. Doesn't seem so bad, so we get to go home and relax about quantum gravity, right? Okay, so, um, Anytime you do a two-loop calculation and get an answer that's not interesting, you should do a three-loop calculation, right? Um, so let's go to three loops. So what sort of diagrams do you encounter at three loops? 
Well, now you have diagrams where there's this loop of the heavy fermion, and now there's gravitons, and the gravitons can now connect you to, for example, a loop of top quarks, uh, and the loop of the top quarks is now connecting to the Higgs. So this is an example of a three-loop diagram where gravity is communicating between this new heavy fermion and the Higgs through a loop of top quarks. Okay. So now you can go ahead and work out this diagram, and this diagram, now it's different. So now, of course, the gravitons are coupling purely to off-shell particles, all right? So there's no guarantee that this diagram is proportional to the Higgs mass, right? Um, in particular, if you do this calculation, you'll find you have the top Yukawa coupling appearing down here, but now the actual momenta that runs in this loop, that saturates this loop diagram, is purely dominated by the UV momentum. It's dominated by the mass of the fermion. And so the answer is you get, you know, three loop factors, you get y top squared, now you get six powers of the fermion mass over m Planck to the fourth. So morally speaking, this is something that looks like a three loop coefficient times something that's a word of the Planck scale squared. Okay, coming in at three loops. So that's now a problem, right? Three loop factors, that's small, but something's proportional to Planck scale squared, that's much larger than the weak scale. And this didn't require us to have any interesting new couplings of this heavy state. It's purely coupling to the standard model through loops of gravitons. Okay. Um, in fact, you could repeat this calculation where you replace the top quark loop with every other loop in the standard model. And what you would get, the answer you would get, right, looks exactly like the quadratic divergence calculation in the standard model where you replace the cutoff of the quadratic divergence with the Planck scale over 16 pi squared. So again, the quadratic divergence calculation for the Higgs mass in the standard model, it's not any real meaningful calculation on its own, but it's a stand-in or a placeholder for other physical effects that are coming in the UV that are finite and in principle calculable. Okay, so obviously this is just a toy model. You know, we don't know that the theory of quantum gravity has Planck scale fermions uh, that contribute in this way, but it should indicate to you that if there's really additional physical degrees of freedom with masses of order the Planck scale, if there's Planck scale slop, that even that talking to us purely through gravitons gives us effects that are large and uh, signal, you know, the quadratic divergence in the Higgs mass is signaling that finite contributions of this form should be a problem. All right. Um, so now I think having at least considered some of the aspects of uh, the weak form of the hierarchy problem and talked a little about the strong form of the hierarchy problem, it's sort of useful to summarize the hierarchy problem uh, at the level of a diagram. So the way that I think about the hierarchy problem uh, is somewhat as follows. We have the standard model, okay? We imagine that the, the theory is defined up into some UV scale where quantum gravity comes in, so this is probably around the Planck scale. We imagine that the Higgs and the standard model itself is a good description of our theory up until somewhere close to this scale, right? So the cutoffs of the standard model field theory and quantum gravity are at least approximately the same scale. And then there's some enormous uh, range of energies between the scale of that cutoff and down at the weak scale, right? Down at the weak, so this is some large hierarchy of energies. There could be additional physical scales that come in somewhere between the cutoff scales, quantum gravity, and the Higgs sector cutoff and the weak scale. So there could be physical scales from unification or dark matter or neutrino masses. You could take it or leave it. Any of these scales, if they're there, give us interesting finite contributions. Then we get down to the low energy version of the standard model and there's more or less a unique vacuum of the Higgs potential, all right? Um, <clears throat> and that unique vacuum of the Higgs potential, the Higgs mass parameter is not a technically natural parameter. There's no symmetry of the theory that's enhanced when we take it to zero. So it's the combination of these factors, the fact that we believe, you know, every piece of evidence we have points to the fact that the cutoff associated with quantum gravity in the standard model is much, much higher than the weak scale. We also have suggestive evidence for additional mass thresholds between that scale and the weak scale. And then when we get down to the weak scale, the Higgs mass parameter is not technically natural. We can't understand why it should be smaller than these scales. And so this separation in light of all of these different scales, that's really the hierarchy problem. Now, what's nice about diagramming it this way, apart from the fact that it's fun to draw cartoons, um, is that if you draw something, then you can at least think about how you would attack it in different ways to try to solve the hierarchy problem. So in particular, solutions to the hierarchy problem might involve violating any one of these sets of assumptions. They could involve violating where we think the cutoff is in relation to the weak scale. They could involve violating the number of vacua over which we could possibly populate to get the standard model that we see. They could involve changing what the low energy degrees of freedom are down here, so perhaps the Higgs mass does become a technically natural parameter, right? So any of those things, attacking this diagram at any point, 
might help us to understand why the weak scale is so much smaller than uh, all of these other scales, given what we now understand as the sensitivity of the Higgs mass to these finite contributions. Okay. So that's a good entree to thinking now about hierarchy solutions. So the way I want to organize this is what I'm going to spend the rest of my lecture on today is mostly talking about hierarchy solutions that you've all probably heard at least a little bit about before. Okay. Um, in particular, you know, the way I learned the standard model was actually to learn the MSSM and then take out super partners. Okay. So you know, there, are versions, there are solutions to the hierarchy problem that are very familiar and very ubiquitous in physics beyond the standard model. So I'm going to talk about those in the rest of my lecture today, but I do want to talk about them in maybe a way or organize them in a way that you haven't thought about before, just to help you to see how the pieces fit together. Then what I want to do with my next lecture, the one that I'll start tomorrow morning, is to start to take a look at solutions to the hierarchy problem that are uh, more recent, ones that people have started to write down in response to null results at the LHC. So there, hopefully, I'll try to even tell you things that you haven't heard before. Uh, and then, of course, we'll finish up tomorrow with talking about other BSM physics at the TEV scale. Okay, so hierarchy solutions. Again, here's our diagram of what really the hierarchy problem is in terms of a separation of scales relative to possible intermediate mass thresholds and the fact that the Higgs mass parameter is not technically natural. So now you could try to attack this problem in different ways, right? You could try to take this diagram and break it down and see if any of the ways of breaking it down somehow undermine the logic behind the existence of a hierarchy problem. Um, so one of the interesting things you could argue is instead of having a theory in which there's more or less a unique vacuum, all right, in which the Higgs VEV and the Higgs mass is setting the value of the weak scale, uh, and somehow those parameters need to be made very different from UV parameters in some way that we don't understand. You could just imagine maybe there are many, many possible vacua, all right, corresponding to different values of the Higgs mass and the Higgs vacuum expectation value. And maybe there's a reason, you know, and maybe they're, they're widely distributed, but maybe in most of these vacua, most of these minima, the values of the Higgs mass and the Higgs VEV are actually proportional to the UV scales. Maybe they're not separated in any useful way. But maybe there are a few vacua in which the Higgs mass and the Higgs VEV are much smaller, all right? Um, now, if that were all, that wouldn't help us to understand the hierarchy problem at all. There, probabilistically, we would end up in a vacuum where the Higgs mass and the Higgs VEV were large. But if you had some extra reason, right, some extra pressure that preferred vacua with small values of the Higgs mass or small values of the Higgs VEV, then if you had a distribution of vacua plus this pressure, you could explain why you ended up in a place where the Higgs mass and the Higgs VEV appear to be fine-tuned. Okay. So the classic uh, version of this argument is anthropic reasoning. The idea behind anthropic reasoning is maybe there's some requirement for a structure to form, for observers to form, that actually forces the Higgs mass and the Higgs vacuum expectation value to be much smaller than its natural value. And if you have many, many different vacua over which the VEV and mass scans, then this anthropic pressure, the pressure to form observers, picks out ones where the Higgs mass and Higgs VEV are small. Okay. Um, let me give you an example of how this argument worked in case you haven't heard it before, in particular in application to the weak scale. So, um, Anytime you run this argument, anytime you try to make a pressure for observers to anthropically explain the value of the weak scale, you have to assume some things about what is allowed to vary between different vacua. Okay? That assumption is necessary in order to come up with some well-defined observer pressure. All right. So the assumptions that I'll make in this case is, let's imagine um, we have many, many different possible minima. Uh, in each minimum, the Higgs vacuum expectation value varies. But something is fixed among all minima that doesn't vary at all, which are the values of the Yukawa couplings, okay? So we fix the Yukawa couplings in all these minima, but we just allow the Higgs VEV to vary. All right. So it turns out, under those assumptions, there is actually a pressure that selects out the weak scale relative to any other scale, okay? And uh, it's basically that once you fix the value of the up-type Yukawa coupling and the down-type Yukawa coupling, then you've specified relationships that determine whether the proton or the neutron is stable. So in particular, you fix the Yukawa couplings. Uh, of course, we know that uh, with fixed Yukawa couplings and the value of the weak scale that we see, the proton is stable and the neutron is unstable. But if we made the Higgs VEV much, much smaller than the value of the VEV that we see in the standard model, protons would decay into neutrons because the mass splitting between the neutron and the proton, uh, if we allowed the VEV to vary relative to the standard model value, it, to leading order has this approximate form, right? So um, if you made the VEV uh, of the weak scale much, much smaller than the value we see, then eventually you would flip the order 
and protons would become unstable to decay into neutrons, and then, of course, we would never end up getting a universe full of all of the proton-based structure that we know and love. Okay. Um, the other problem, so that, that tells you that would be a reason to exclude values of the Higgs vacuum expectation value much smaller than the weak scale. You could also ask what happens, is there a reason to exclude values of the vacuum expectation value much larger than the weak scale? So what happens if you make the VEV uh, much larger than the value that we see? The neutron is actually no longer stable with the nuclei, right? So in our universe, the neutron is stabilized with the nuclei uh, because of the differences between nuclear binding energies and the mass splittings. But if we made the Higgs VEV much larger than the value we see, now uh, the mass splitting between the proton and the neutron exceeds nuclear binding energies. So then it would become possible for the neutron to decay within nuclei, and then you would never actually be able to make large nuclei, and again, you would never get interesting rich structure and observers. You would have a universe that was poor in, uh, in any sort of advanced nuclei. Okay. So these two bounds, right, there's a reason if you kept the Yukawas fixed and you varied the Higgs VEV, something bad happens that doesn't give us a universe that forms sort of structure that we see if we make the Higgs VEV too small, and something bad happens if we make the VEV too large. Now, the details of where these boundaries lie are a little flexible, but loosely speaking, that picks out a window of about an order of magnitude around the weak scale uh, where, in fact, protons are stable and neutrons are stabilized within nuclei. Okay. So, that might seem very suggestive to you. If we had lots of different vacua over which we scanned uh, the value of the uh, electric vacuum expectation value, there's actually a reason why only in a certain range, even if it's finely tuned, we actually get something that has uh, the structure of proton stability and nuclear stability that we see. Okay. That's a nice argument, right? But you'll notice it required a large assumption, which is that in all of these different vacua over which I varied the Higgs vacuum expectation value, I had to assume the Yukawas were fixed, right? If I allowed the Yukawas to vary, then of course this whole argument goes away. If I allow the up quark Yukawa and the down quark Yukawa to vary relative to each other, then there's no bound in the space of vacuum expectation values, and there's no reason for an anthropic pressure to pick out the weak scale where it is. So anthropic arguments are interesting, right? They're very suggestive. It may be, in fact, why the weak scale is so much smaller than the Planck scale. But right now, we don't have any robust argument for why it should be the case. And every argument that places some sort of anthropic bound puts in as many assumptions as it gets out, predictions or postdictions. So uh, anthropics may be the answer to why the weak scale is so small, but uh, from my perspective, at least, the jury is still out. A second option that's suggestive, if you just look at this diagram, is you say, look, why did we have to assume right, that the cutoff of quantum gravity in the Higgs was so far above the weak scale? Now, there's a natural reason to assume it, right? We see that gravity is weak, and the weakness of gravity points to the existence of this high scale. But maybe there is some more complicated physics that causes the cutoff either of the Higgs alone or of the Higgs and quantum gravity to come down to much lower scales. And if the cutoff is at much lower scales, then there's no problem, right? Then the weak scale could be very close to the highest fundamental scale that the Higgs probes. Okay, so you either just bring down the cutoff of the Higgs keeping the scale of quantum gravity high, or you bring down the cutoff of everything close to the weak scale, either one of these would help to solve the hierarchy problem. And of course, there are lots of different uh, ways to realize this, actual microphysical mechanisms to explain why the cutoff is low. Uh, we write them down in various dimensions. So in five dimensions, for example, we know that if uh, we live at one end of a slice of ADS5, then we get a randall syndrome like theory in which the effective cutoff of the standard model is a much lower than the scale of quantum gravity. Um, in four dimensions, that has a manifestation in the form of technicolor, where the Higgs, uh, well, electric symmetry breaking is just the result of some sort of condensate of strong interactions, an exact analogy with the breaking of chiral symmetry in QCD. Uh, we also know, you know, another option is to dilute the effective strength of gravity just by having large, flat extra dimensions. Uh, or equivalently, in four dimensions, we could have 10 to the 32 copies of the standard model. These would all dilute the strength of gravity relative to the strength of quantum field theory and explain why gravity, the scale of gravity seems to be so high. Um, or we could imagine, in fact, that the, the fundamental theory of quantum gravity is a string theory, but the string, coupling scale, the string coupling constant is very, very small. That also would make the apparent scale of quantum gravity very high, even if the actual cutoff of field theory was very low. Okay, so we have lots of ways of lowering the cutoff. This has dominated model building uh, for the last 20 years. Um, there's an issue with all of these things, though, which is that if you just lower the cutoff to make it close to the weak scale, nothing tells you that the Higgs is well separated from any of the physics associated with the cutoff. 
So that means a lot of things. One, it means that all of the irrelevant operators that we could add to the standard model, right, all of those dimension five operators and dimension six operators and dimension 15 operators, I don't know, I, how many dimension 15 operators are there? Some enormous number of dimension 15 operators. All of those operators, right, the most they're suppressed by is the cutoff of your theory. So if the cutoff of your theory is a TeV, if that's what's explaining the value of the weak scale, then all of those irrelevant operators should be present, and they should be present with suppression scales that are of order of TeV. Now that runs up against a lot of strong bounds we have. Many of the bounds we have push out to the multi-TeV scale. Okay. So lowering the cutoff alone, this is really in tension with the fact that what we see so far is we see a Higgs and we see apparently a mass gap. We have yet to see any other new states beneath the TeV scale. And we have yet to see evidence for any irrelevant operators that are suppressed by order of TV scale. So just lowering the cutoff is an interesting idea, but um, so far, all the evidence we have, it's not just that we haven't found evidence for it, but really all the suggestions we have are that the cutoff is not sitting in a TV. Okay. So I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time talking about lowering the cutoff uh, remaining in this lecture. I will try to give you a new idea for lowering the cutoff next lecture that I promise none of you have ever heard before. Uh, but that's just an advertisement for tomorrow morning. You might have heard of it. Okay. All right. So what's the third option? Well, the problem was in the standard model, if we took the Higgs mass parameter to zero, there was no enhanced symmetry, so we couldn't understand it from the perspective of technical naturalness. So the sort of obvious thing to do is say, great, let's expand the standard model, right, with new degrees of freedom, so that when I take the Higgs mass to zero, there's a new symmetry, right? If I do that, then the Higgs mass becomes a technically natural parameter, and can I, I can understand why it's, it's small. Okay, so that's sort of this cartoon. You keep the cutoffs high of the Higgs sector and quantum gravity, but you extend the standard model, so there's a new symmetry that is manifest when we take the Higgs mass to zero. And um, for reasons that I'll argue in the rest of this lecture, there's basically two ways you can do this. You can dress them up in lots of fancy ways, but there's pretty much two symmetries you can choose. You can choose supersymmetry, or you can choose a global symmetry. Um, and both of these can have the effect of making the Higgs mass parameter technically natural. Now, the advantage of symmetries over lowering the cutoff is the fundamental cutoff of your theory can be very high. As long as the symmetries are good symmetries up at that scale and remain good symmetries down until somewhat close to the weak scale, right, then you can have a parametric separation. You can have a weak scale that is small. It's associated with the goodness of the symmetry. And you can still have cutoffs of quantum gravity in the standard model that are very high. All right. So that means all the irrelevant operators that we haven't yet seen, we can naturally understand that because the genuine cutoff at which they arise is much, much higher than the weak scale. We can see Higgs down at low energies, and there can be a bit of a mass gap between the Higgs and any new particles associated with the symmetry as long as the theory is weakly coupled. Okay. So the advantage of thinking about symmetry solutions to the hierarchy problem is, at the very least, they're consistent with all of the hints that we have so far. There appears to be a Higgs and a mass gap, we don't have a whole host of irrelevant uh, operators showing up at a TeV, and that's easy to understand from the perspective of a symmetry. Okay. <clears throat> so, of course, we see the standard model at the weak scale, right? We don't see the standard model plus new stuff. Uh, so if there is a symmetry that extends the standard model, then it has to be broken at some scale that is somewhat above the weak scale. And so now it's a useful question to ask, okay, where should, you know, even without specifying the details, where does the new stuff associated with the symmetry have to show up in order for the Higgs mass to be about the right size? Now, talking about, so how, how, do we, how do we come up with that estimate? Well, the way we come up with that estimate is if we have a symmetry, there should be some new particles. Those new particles give us these finite corrections to the Higgs mass, just like the finite corrections we've been considering last lecture in this lecture. And so we can ask, okay, uh, how big are the finite corrections to the Higgs mass coming from these new particles? relative to the Higgs mass that we see itself, right? There's some ratio, and that ratio approximately tells us the fine tuning of the Higgs mass, right? If the ratio is too large, it tells us all these finite contributions have to cancel to some precision, uh, whereas if the ratio is small, that's good because it tells us that each individual correction of the Higgs mass is not larger than the Higgs mass itself. Okay, there are lots of ways to define fine tuning. I, it's not particularly meaningful, so I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but that's a loose, rough guess to uh, what sort of if, if new physics is going to come in and explain the Higgs mass and they're not to be fine-tuning, you want each finite contribution of the Higgs mass not to be much bigger than the Higgs mass itself. Okay, so <clears throat> to figure out what scale the new physics should come in, we can use the quadratic divergence as a guide. Again, remember, the quadratic divergence is not the thing itself, but it's just a stand-in, and we would replace, in a real finite theory, that cutoff with the mass of new particles. Okay, 
So, you know, if we don't want the tuning of the Higgs mass to be too big, that requires the new physics enter right around 500 GeV, about half a TeV. If we're willing to take 10% level tuning, right, this ratio to be about 10, that requires the new physics come at about one and a half TeV. And if we're willing to take about 1% level tuning, that requires the new physics to enter somewhere around five TeV or less. Okay, so this is why, right, when it comes to thinking about physics beyond the standard model at a TeV scale, this is why the hierarchy problem and symmetry solutions to the hierarchy problem are really intimately connected to the TeV scale. If we want to get the Higgs mass right, it tells us some new symmetry should be showing up. It should be showing up somewhere, you know, I don't know exactly where, I don't know how much tuning the universe is willing to tolerate, but clearly it should be showing up somewhere around the TeV scale. I want to emphasize, so again, this is a strategy, right? The strategy says we see a Higgs mass, we see a mass gap, we don't see irrelevant operators, we know there's a hierarchy problem, all right? So a suggestive way to solve it is to introduce a new symmetry uh, that explains why the Higgs mass is technically natural. And then making sure that the Higgs mass is not finely tuned from all the finite corrections related to the symmetry, that tells us about the mass scale where the new particles should enter. I just want to emphasize, you know, this is a strategy for thinking about new physics at the TeV scale, right? It's not a no-lose theorem. The universe could be finely tuned, the weak scale could be finely tuned, and quantum field theory would not cease to function, right? Quantum field theory has no problem with the fine tuning. It's just we as human beings that have problems with fine tuning. But we have lots of reasons to think that this is a good strategy. Uh, so I gave you a couple other examples of naturalness in nature when I was trying to motivate naturalness in quantum field theory. But let me give you a very specific uh, example of how naturalness arguments work, uh, where the naive value of a scalar uh, indicates new physics coming into the cutoff, and that in nature we actually go see new physics showing up exactly where we'd expect from that argument. Okay. So uh, the example is the following. So of course the Higgs is the first apparently elementary scalar that we've seen in nature. But we've seen scalars and pseudoscalars before, just as bound states of the strong interactions, right? When QCD confines, it creates a whole host of bound states. Uh, the most interesting, in some sense, are the pions, right? The pseudoscalars, the, the, the pseudo-goldstone bosons, a spontaneous Carroll symmetry breaking. So pions are goldstones. Um, they get you know, some amount of mass from explicit breaking from quark masses. Uh, but it's also the case that electromagnetism, right, QED, the couplings of QED actually explicitly break the global symmetries that protect the pions, okay? So in particular, uh, the photon couples to the charged pion, but not the neutral pion. And uh, because it's the coupling to the charged pion violates the shift symmetry that protects the pion masses, there is a diagram that's like the quadratic divergence diagrams of the Higgs, where you take a charged pion and you just compute, say, a quadratic divergence coming from a loop of a photon, right? Again, the quadratic divergence is just a stand-in that if there's some heavy particles the photon talks to, they will dominate that, uh, that mass parameter. So there's a quadratic divergence for the pion mass. It's not present for, excuse me, there's a quadratic divergence for the charged pion mass coming from photon loops. There's no quadratic divergence for the neutral pion. And so you'd expect, of course, there would be a charged pion, neutral pion mass splitting, right? The charged pion has a quadratic divergence. The neutral pion doesn't. Their masses should be different, okay? So you can work out what's the difference, what's the difference that would be due to the quadratic divergence. So the difference between the charged pion mass and the neutral pion mass due to the quadratic divergence is proportional to the QED coupling, uh, and it's a quadratic divergence. So if you integrate it up to cutoff, it's something lambda squared. So now you can ask yourself exactly the same question we just asked for the Higgs, right? For the Higgs we asked, if there's a new symmetry, new particles come in to protect the Higgs mass, they can't be too much heavier than a TeV, otherwise their contributions to the Higgs mass would be too big, right? So you can ask yourself a question here too, right? If something comes in to cut off this divergence, if some new physical scale comes in uh, to give us a finite contribution, we actually know we've measured the mass splitting between these two, so we should be able to guess where the new physics should come in, right? So the mass splitting in squared MeV, it's 35.5 MeV quantity squared. That's the mass splitting between the charge and neutral pion. So if you just assume that that whole splitting were due to this quadratic divergence, it would tell you new physics should enter to saturate this quadratic divergence at around 850 MeV, okay? That's the natural expectation. That's what naturalness would tell you should be true. Sure enough, okay, what happens? The rho meson, which is new physics, that's the first indication of compositeness as far as the pions are concerned. The Rho meson shows up in this effective field theory uh, at 770 MeV, okay? So in other words, we can think of the mass splitting between the charged and neutral pion. It's proportional to quadratic divergence. 
it gives us, the size of the quadratic divergence gives us natural expectation for the scale where we should have new degrees of freedom. And sure enough, in QCD, we see those new degrees of freedom exactly where the naturalness argument led us to expect. Okay, this doesn't guarantee the naturalness argument works for the Higgs, but it's very suggestive that these arguments have some merit. Yes? So in this particular, really what it should be, so in general, right, imagine I had many different scales, right? Ultimately, as we saw from, you know, so as we saw from our previous examples about the weak version of the hierarchy problem, if I have many different finite scales, all of them will contribute. In particular, the highest one will dominate, okay? So in order for this argument to, to hold or to be useful, what has to come in here has to be something that cuts off any higher contribution. So in the case of a symmetry argument, right, you would say what comes in here has to be whatever new particles manifest the symmetry that's protecting the Higgs mass from higher scales, okay? In the case of the Pion example, it's not a symmetry, it's compositeness, right? That really what's happening uh, when you hit the cutoff where the rho meson enters is you're actually now starting to probe the compositeness scale of these degrees of freedom. That's the point where you start to see that they're not elementary scalars after all, right? They actually have a size, okay? So, Technically, the entry of the rho meson here, saturating the quadratic divergence and giving us the right number, that's because it's compositeness that's cutting off any higher contributions, but the way in which symmetries work should be analogous. Okay. But yeah, no, it's a, it's a nice, precise question. Thanks. Okay, all right, so, you know, just a strategy, but it's been a useful strategy, so let's see how far it takes us. All right, so we wanna know what symmetries can we use, right? If we wanna take the standard model, enhance it with some new degrees of freedom so that there's a symmetry that is manifest when we take the Higgs mass to zero. So uh, Coleman and Mandula, of course, tell us, you know, that there's a very small set of possibilities available to us, um, namely that the only possible interesting symmetries in an interacting theory with a mass gap in more than one plus one dimensions are the normal uh, symmetries that we think of uh, as Lorentz transformations and energy momentum, and then we can possibly have extra scalar symmetry charges, okay? So scalar symmetry charges correspond to internal symmetries, and in the particular case of the Higgs in four dimensions, those internal symmetries would just be global symmetries. So the original form of the coleman mandula theorem basically just tells us the thing that, a symmetry that could protect the Higgs, as far as the symmetry we could add in four dimensions, could be a global symmetry. Of course, Coleman and Mandula uh, didn't know that there was a possibility of having spinorial symmetry charges, so they missed that. Uh, but subsequently, of course, it was come to, to be understood that there's an extension of the coleman mandula theorem, where you can also extend your space-time symmetries to include a symmetry that has spinorial charges. Uh, and of course, we recognize the extension of space-time symmetries to include spinorial charges is supersymmetry. Okay, so basically, the two options we have for protecting the Higgs mass uh, in four dimensions are global symmetry or supersymmetry. Now, you can do lots of fancy things. You can put your theory in higher dimensions uh, when you can use gauge symmetries in higher dimensions, but at the end of the day, your four-dimensional effective theory, when you actually boil it down and ask what is the effective field theory around the scale of the Higgs, there's one of two symmetries that are operative at the end of the day. Either it's a global symmetry or it's supersymmetry. So that's good. That gives us a finite list of things to go think about. Uh, so let's now think about how both of those might work. Okay. So whether it's supersymmetry or global symmetry, if it's protecting the Higgs mass, they're both going to work in approximately the same way. They're symmetries that should be good symmetries in the far UV of the theory, right? They have to explain why arbitrary physics from quantum gravity or from unification or from anything else doesn't give large contributions to the Higgs mass. So that would be true if these symmetries are good symmetries at high energies and short distances. But because we don't see the symmetries manifest at the weak scale, the symmetries have to be broken at some scale that's close to the weak scale, okay? So that means we should expect new partner particles associated with the mass, you know, they, those are the, the new particles associated with the symmetry. They're separated from the weak scale by however the symmetry is broken. So there should be new partner particles. Those partner particles, of course, they talk to the Higgs. So they give finite corrections to the Higgs mass. And so we know those are finite things, nothing to do with quadratic divergences. We can't make these particles arbitrarily heavier than the Higgs because then their finite corrections to the Higgs mass would be too large and there would be a fine tuning. Okay, so that tells us in both cases there should be new partner particles, then there can be a bit of a mass gap that could correspond to a loop factor, and then we should see the Higgs. Okay. And I'm gonna keep emphasizing this parallel between supersymmetry and global symmetries throughout the rest of this lecture. 
really, so you know, sort of the way things play out is there are usually people who think about supersymmetry, and then there are people who think about global symmetries, and they usually don't meet or talk to each other or become friends. But um, really, apart from a few minor details, they're doing the same thing. Okay. And so I really want to emphasize that to you in what follows. Okay. So something else that's common, whether you use supersymmetry or global symmetries to protect the Higgs mass, is in both of these cases, the idea is you're protecting the Higgs with some symmetry that's a continuous symmetry, and that continuous symmetry commutes with the standard model gauge group. So that's an extra interesting piece of information. It tells you whatever new particles are predicted by your symmetry, they're going to carry the same uh, quantum numbers into the standard model as whatever counterparts they're related to by the symmetry. So that tells you not only are you going to get new particles, but you're going to get new particles with standard model quantum numbers. Okay. Now, the particles you get depend on the symmetry. So in the case of supersymmetry, a symmetry transformation relates, takes a scalar a little bit into a fermion, and a fermion a little bit into a scalar. Okay? So the new particles associated with supersymmetry are opposite statistics from their original friends in the standard model. If it's a global symmetry, the idea is that the Higgs is a pseudo-Goldstone boson of a spontaneously broken global symmetry. And so that means every standard model field should be enhanced into a multiplet of that larger symmetry. So there should be new particles that have the same statistics as their standard model counterparts. All right, so there's a difference in statistics, but otherwise, no major differences. And in both cases, all of these new particles, they talk to the Higgs, they give finite corrections to the Higgs mass that you can go ahead and calculate. All right, so let's start with supersymmetry. Uh, who has not learned about supersymmetry? It's okay if you haven't. Okay, great, all right, I'm gonna keep it brief. So actually, uh, so I taught this quarter at uh, my university, I taught a whole quarter course on, on supersymmetry, and um, I spent 15 minutes talking about supersymmetry as applied to the hierarchy problem, and the entire rest of the time talking about supersymmetry as a way of understanding the phases of strongly coupled gauge theories. And um, that may be more and more how we spend our time thinking about supersymmetry, but right now, let's, uh, let's think about supersymmetry as it might apply to the hierarchy problem. Okay, so what is supersymmetry? So supersymmetry is um, the natural extension of uh, space-time symmetry, the natural extension of Poincaré symmetry to include spinorial charges. Um, there are uh, various, you know, in four dimensions, you can add, you can construct supersymmetric theories with uh, varying numbers of spinorial supercharges. So the minimal number is one that includes basically four independent charges that are grouped into two spinners, all right? So these are the two, the two independent uh, spinorial supercharges corresponding to, to four total uh, new conserved charges. And that corresponds to the minimal amount of supersymmetry that's possible in four dimensions. So basically what you do is you add these spinorial charges to the Poincaré symmetry, uh, and you of course define whatever appropriate commutators and anti-commutators you need to define to, uh, in order to construct an extended uh, super Poincaré algebra. So in particular, if you have the minimal amount of supersymmetry, uh, you can work out what the natural extension of the Poincaré algebra has to be to include them. So in particular, these new charges have to commute with energy momentum, uh, and they have uh, a natural uh, commutator with Lorentz transformations, just given by the fact that they transform as spinners under Lorentz transformations. So that dictates the form of the commutator uh, with Lorentz transformations. Uh, of course, you also have to specify uh, how the algebra relates to the charges themselves, because these are spinorial Grassmann uh, charges. Uh, their algebra is defined by uh, anti-commutators, and the natural anti-commutator uh, of the, the dotted and undotted supercharges gives you energy momentum. There are various options that you can define for the anti-commutator of the supercharges with themselves, but for minimal supersymmetry, they have a vanishing anti-commutator. Okay, so this just defines, you know, there's nothing fancy about this. Basically, the idea is you take Poincaré, you add some new spinorial charges to it, you work out what the possible algebra is consistent with adding those to Poincaré, this is it, and then everything else is just working out the consequences, okay. So just as when you have the Poincaré algebra, then what do you do? Then you proceed through the Wigner classification of irreducible representations, right? So you ask how things could transform with respect to the little group, and that tells you that your fields have to be spin zero and spin a half and spin one and spin three halves and spin two and so forth. Now, if you do a super extension of Poincaré, you can go through the Wigner classification in the same way, and now you can construct things that have to transform in a well-defined way under supersymmetry transformation. Okay. So the objects, the, the irreducible representations of the supersymmetric extension of Poincaré are superfields. So they combine fields of different statistics uh, into one object that transforms in a well-defined way 
under supersymmetry transformations. So I don't want to get into a lot of the technical details. We can summarize some of the important features qualitatively. So the superfields contain both bosons and fermions, and that's because you know, the supercharges, right, the generators of supersymmetry transformations, uh, because they're spinners, if you take it and you act on a bosonic state, that's going to be a fermionic state. And similarly, if you act on a fermionic state, that's going to be a bosonic state. So the things that are irreducible representations of the supersymmetry algebra, the of supersymmetry, are going to combine both bosons and fermions into one multiplet. Okay. You can then convince yourself of a few other interesting facts. So you can compute, for example, uh, for any given one of these super multiplets, you can compute the trace over all the states, basically that counts the fermion number in that state. And you can prove to yourself uh, that each one of these uh, super multiplets has to contain the same number of bosonic and fermionic degrees of freedom. So every multiplet doesn't just contain bosons and fermions, it contains the same number. Okay. The other thing you can convince yourself of is uh, because the supercharges have vanishing commutators with energy momentum, they also have vanishing commutators with uh, energy momentum squared. And that means that in particular for on-shell states, that tells you, among other things, that any different components that live in the same supermultiplet have to have the same mass. Okay, so every supermultiplet has equal number of bosons and fermions, they've all got the same mass. All right. You can also prove to yourself, this is fun, uh, there's at most one, for minimal supersymmetry, there's most, at most one global symmetry, an abelian global symmetry, that doesn't commute with the supercharges, okay? So there's particularly, there's a unique one, uh, so we call it the U1R symmetry, that uh, has a non-vanishing commutator with the supercharges, call that the U1R, but all other gauge and global symmetries have to commute with the supercharges. So that means, Apart from the, the charges under this U1R, all the different components of the same supermultiplet have to have the same gauge and global quantum numbers. In particular, they have to have the same charges under the standard model. Okay. Um, and then finally, if I have some multiplet that consists of some bosons and some fermions, I can just see what happens if I do a supersymmetry transformation at the level of the fields, how the scalars transform and how the fermions transform. The scalars transform a little bit into their fermionic partners that live in the same multiplet, and the fermions transform, for example, a little bit into their scalar partners that live in the same multiplet. Okay, so that's you know supersymmetry in two slides. All right. <clears throat> so if you want to extend the standard model so that supersymmetry is a good symmetry of the standard model at high energies, what you basically have to do is take every field that you see in the standard model and expand it to be a whole supermultiplet. So for every fermion in the standard model, it needs to live in a supermultiplet with some uh, bosonic partner, and for every boson in the standard model, it has to live in a supermultiplet with some fermionic partner. Okay, so that leads to hideous looking tables of the following form, right? So the idea is, look, we have three generations of the fermions, Q, U, D, L, E, right? Those now all have to be paired up with their scalar counterparts into multiplets, okay? So for every fermion, there's a scalar counterpart. Um, for all the gauge fields, the spin one gauge fields of the standard model, we have to pair those up with fermionic counterparts. So they all get paired up uh, with fermionic counterparts into, into uniform multiplets under supersymmetry. In each case, the multiplets all have the same standard model quantum numbers, again, because the supercharges commute with the standard model gauge charges. And then the only thing that's funny about the minimal supersymmetric extension of the standard model is whereas in the standard model we can afford to have one Higgs doublet, in the supersymmetric extension of it we have to have two. Um, and there's two reasons for that. Uh, the simple reason is that because, so the standard model is anomaly free, right? Um, if we added an arbitrary number of scalars to the standard model it would still be anomaly free because scalars don't contribute to anomalies. But when we supersymmetrize the theory, right, now for the Higgs, now we have to add fermionic counterparts of the Higgs. So if we only had one Higgs doublet, then we would have to add fermions with the same standard model quantum numbers as the Higgs doublet, and those would now give us anomalies, okay. So to cancel the anomalies, the way we do it is we have two Higgs doublets, both of them have fermionic partners, and they have opposite charges in the standard model, that guarantees the anomalies still cancel, okay. So that's one simple reason to understand why the minimal supersymmetric extension of the standard model has to have two Higgs doublets instead of just the one in the standard model. Okay, so I know it's a hideous table, but that was all the important physics, uh, so now we can, we can move on. Of course, as we've said, you know, if supersymmetry is what's protecting the Higgs uh, from physics in the far UV, we don't see superpartners degenerate with their uh, standard model counterparts, right? That was a consequence of unbroken supersymmetry. If supersymmetry is a good symmetry, it tells us the bosons and fermions have the same mass. We don't see that in nature, so something must break the symmetry. 
Um, and we can break the symmetry in a way that makes sure it's still a good symmetry in the ultraviolet if we break the symmetry only with relevant operators, right? So now this is why I bored you to death with the discussion of relevant, marginal, irrelevant operators in my first lecture, right? We know if we have a relevant operator, it, can, it becomes large and important only in the infrared, and in other words, it becomes small as we go to the ultraviolet. So if we break supersymmetry only with relevant terms, that tells us we can make supersymmetry not a good symmetry at long distances, but a good symmetry at short distances. Okay. So uh, the way that we typically introduce supersymmetry breaking, the way we parametrize it in the minimal extension of the standard model, um, is to turn on mass parameters, we call them soft terms, for all of the new partner particles. So we write down mass terms for the fermionic counterparts of the gauge bosons. We write down mass terms for all of the scalar counterparts uh, of standard model fermions. And uh, of course, we can write down mass terms for the Higgs multiplets. And these now split the fermions uh, from the scalars, but they constitute a soft breaking of uh, supersymmetry. So any radiative corrections, right, even if these parameters violate supersymmetry, any radiative corrections if they violate supersymmetry, they have to be proportional to these parameters themselves. Okay, so we're preserving a notion of technical naturalness. All right, so this turning on these terms allows us to make supersymmetry a good symmetry in the UV to protect the Higgs from arbitrary physics at high energies, but to understand why we don't see new partners that are exactly degenerate with their standard model counterparts. All right, so how does this exactly relate to the hierarchy problem? So far I've been a little bit vague about how supersymmetry is actually solving the hierarchy problem. Well, there's a one-line way to understand what supersymmetry is doing, right? So supersymmetry relates bosons and fermions. So loosely speaking, the Higgs is a scalar. It's now related to a fermion. We know fermion masses are technically natural because of chiral symmetry, right? So supersymmetry, all it's really doing is saying, hey, Higgs, be related to a fermion. We can understand why the fermion mass is small, and therefore by supersymmetry, the Higgs mass is also understood to be small. Okay, that's the one-line answer if anyone ever you know, puts your back against the wall in a dark alleyway and asks you to explain why supersymmetry solves the hierarchy problem, that's really it, right? Uh, it just relates a scalar to a fermion and uses the technical naturalness of the fermion mass. Of course, um, it would be nice to see what happens to the quadratic divergences, right? Uh, we should see somehow if supersymmetry is really protecting the Higgs, the quadratic divergences are just a stand-in for UV sensitivity. But we should see in a supersymmetric theory that those have to somehow disappear, right? If supersymmetry is really protecting us from the UV, the quadratic divergences should somehow cancel. And sure enough, they do. So in particular, you can look, for example, at uh, in the standard model, we have the Higgs coupling to top quarks. And now in the supersymmetric extension, the top quarks have scalar partners. And supersymmetry dictates those couplings be related to the original couplings of the Higgs to the top quarks. And so now, if you had the diagram in the standard model that gave you the quadratic divergence, right? There's a corresponding diagram from loops of the scalars. The sign is flipped because it's a scalar loop instead of a fermion loop, but the coefficients are the same because of supersymmetry. And so that explains, in fact, the quadratic divergences vanish. So again, that's a sign supersymmetry is protecting you from physics in the ultraviolet. What's left over if the scalars are heavier than the fermions because I've broken supersymmetry with these mass terms then the quadratic divergences cancel, but what's left over is a finite piece that's proportional to the mass of the scalars. Okay. So this is a beautiful manifestation of many things. Right? One, it's a manifestation of the fact that I still get finite corrections, so these particles can't be arbitrarily heavy, because if they were, then this finite piece, which has nothing to do with quadratic divergences, would be much bigger than the Higgs mass. The other thing that it does right, is it tells us now, it gives us a more concrete sense of what I meant about the strong form of the hierarchy problem. Right? I said in the strong form of the hierarchy problem, what you actually imagine is your UV theory is finite, everything is calculable, right? and then this quadratic divergence is actually a direct indication that there was some high scale that was contributing to your mass parameters. So in supersymmetry, what's happening, the quadratic divergence part is canceling. Right? The new supersymmetry is making the theory finite, and the, the finite thing that contributes to the Higgs mass unambiguously is just coming from the masses of these new partner particles. Okay. So that's a manifestation of the strong form of the hierarchy problem. There's no UV sensitivity. The Higgs mass is totally calculable in principle. And if you calculate it, you find that it's exactly proportional to the masses of the new particles that are making the theory finite. All right, so that's, that's pretty cool. Okay. Uh, 
Um, so what do we do after that? Well, so now we have this idea, right? The symmetry has to come in. The particles associated with the symmetry have to be somewhere close to the weak scale. We want the, you know, they each give a contribution to the Higgs mass. And so uh, we should expect to see them at various mass scales if their contributions to the Higgs mass are not finely tuned. All right, so uh, you can sort of organize. So, so that gives you a strategy. There are lots of different particles that you predict when you extend the standard model to include supersymmetry. Um, but some of the particles are more important than others because they give larger contributions to the Higgs mass. Okay. So that gives you a natural way of organizing where, if the Higgs mass is natural, where these new partner particles have to show up. Uh, and the answer is in supersymmetry, there's sort of a ranked ordering of where they show up. So the things that have to be closest in mass to the Higgs are the fermionic partners of the Higgs itself, which we call the Higgs xenos. And the reason for that is, again, because if the supersymmetry is just relating a scalar mass to a fermion mass, and the fermion mass is technically natural, that fermion mass can't be very different from the Higgs mass, right? Um, okay, so the, the thing that has to be closest to the Higgs mass are the fermionic partners of the Higgs, the Higgs xenos. That's because there's a tree-level relation between the Higgs mass and their mass. And then there are partners, for example, of the top quarks and partners of the gluons and partners of the W and Z bosons. These can afford to be somewhat heavier because their corrections to the Higgs mass are suppressed by loop factors and small coefficients. Okay, but loosely speaking, there's a picture where if supersymmetry is natural and it explains the value of the Higgs mass, there's a natural set of things that we expect to see and they can't be too heavy uh, in order for the theory to be natural. Okay. And then there's a pretty natural, there's a simple strategy. If you have a beautiful hadron collider like the LHC, um, you have some particles that are charged under QCD, right? There's the new particles that are associated with the top quarks or with the gluon. These things are charged under QCD. If you smash protons together, you should make a bunch of them, and then you should just go look for them. So I'll go through this pretty quickly, but we do go look for them in abundance, of course. So we have lots of searches. You know, I would say about half of the LHC physics program is focused on looking for evidence of solutions to the hierarchy problem. You could say this is either a sign that the hierarchy problem is very important or that we have a bad misallocation of our resources. I leave that up to you. Um, but for example, you, know, you produce copiously these new partners of the top quark. They have various decay modes depending on their masses and couplings. And so far, you know, we go to the LHC, we look for them in very elaborate ways. The experimentalists, by the way, are the true heroes here because they're doing an incredible job of looking for these signals uh, and it's not their fault that nothing's shown up yet. So the bounds right now in these particles, these top partners are now pushing generically out past the TeV scale. And if you remember, that's quite a bit larger than the scale. If everything was natural, that's quite a bit further out than what we expected. So this is starting to look a little uncomfortable. And the story is the same for the other partner particles. Partners of the gluons have even stronger bounds out to 2 TeV. It's enough to make you pretty uncomfortable. Okay. All right, so supersymmetry, interesting idea, beautiful predictions, nice way to see how the hierarchy problem gets solved. Only problem is, so far, no evidence, right? Okay. Still could be there, I'm not gonna say it's not there, but um, as young people, you are not tied to historical or traditional ideas about how the universe should work. So um, you shouldn't be overly impressed by the historical prominence of supersymmetry, and you should take the fact that we haven't found evidence for supersymmetry maybe as a sign that you should think about a broader set of possibilities. Okay. So let's turn to global symmetries, right? This was the other option. Maybe the Higgs was protected by global symmetry. Um, so there are lots of ways that global symmetries could work to protect the Higgs mass. They're not quite as constrained as supersymmetry. So I just want to give you a simple example. It's just a toy model, but it has all the important features of how a global symmetry might protect the Higgs. Okay, so let's just start with a baby warm-up to remind ourselves of how the pieces fit together. So just consider an SUN global symmetry, okay? Um, and we imagine there's some scalar transforming the fundamental of that, that SUN global symmetry. So let's imagine we rig up the potential of that scalar so it gets a vacuum expectation value. So it's a fundamental, so that vacuum expectation value is gonna break SUN to SUN minus one. And uh, we all know how to count gold stones, right? So the number of gold stones that come from this pattern of global symmetry breaking is equal to the difference in the number of generators between the two symmetries. All right, so that's n squared minus one versus n minus one squared minus one. So there should be two n minus one gold stones coming from this pattern of spontaneous symmetry breaking. Uh, now it's convenient to organize those two n minus one gold stones into n minus one complex scalars plus one real scalar. And uh, we can then expand, so this is our original scalar field phi, whose vacuum expectation value broke the symmetry. 
but we can parameterize the gold stones in terms of that original field and the vacuum expectation value. All right, so what we do, so this is our normal exponential parameterization of the Goldstone manifold. So we write the original field in terms of an exponential of the Goldstones. And we arrange the Goldstones in a way uh, that, cor that makes evident the fact that they correspond to the broken generators, okay? And then at low energies, we can really think of, of course, there's some extra fluctuations of this field. There's a radial mode, but that's very heavy. At low energies, the only thing that survives, the low energy effective theory, are just these gold stones that parameterize this pattern of global symmetry breaking. Okay, so we typically write this as the gold stone parameterization of this original field. So if I just wanna understand this theory at low energies, it suffices to understand the effective theory of the gold stones. All right, so one thing we wanna understand is how do the gold stones transform under the unbroken symmetry? Okay, so it's convenient to parameterize, you know, we started out with SUN, we broke it to SUN minus one. So there are a set of the original generators that give me the unbroken SUN minus one transformations. It's convenient, we have sort of, I'm picking a basis where those generators, the generators of the unbroken N minus one, I just write as, in terms of uh, generators of the original SUN, I write as a subgroup, a subset of N minus one generators, and then the identity in the final component, okay. So we know how the original scale, scalar phi transforms, right? It transforms as a fundamental. So if I do a transformation by the unbroken SUN minus one, that's just this transformation of the scalar phi. Now I can write phi in terms of my Goldstone parameterization, and I can insert a useful form of one, all right? And that then tells me, so also the vacuum expectation value uh, is left unaltered by the SUN minus one transformation, so this part is just the original vacuum expectation value, and then I can exponentiate these transformations to come live up here by the, the gold stones, okay. So that tells me how this field transforms under the unbroken N minus one, and in particular, if I expand this out in terms of my gold stone fields, I can see how the gold stone fields transform, right? I'm just reading out what happens up in this exponent. So the gold stone fields transform like this, but then I write this out in terms of the subgroup of unbroken generators, and that just tells me my little, my little complex scalars transform as a fundamental under the unbroken SUN minus one, and then I have this last real scalar that's left over as a singlet, okay? So that was convenient because it tells us if I started out with SUN, I spontaneously break it to SUN minus one, I end up with all these gold stones, but the gold stones just organize themselves nicely into gold stones that transform as the fundamental of the unbroken symmetry plus a singlet, okay? Now, I can also ask how do the Goldstones transform under the broken symmetry generators, and in general, that's a much more complicated mess, but at least for small transformations, for small transformations, the Goldstones transform under a shift uh, under symmetry transformations of the broken symmetries. Okay, so this is the familiar fact, right, that Goldstone bosons enjoy a shift symmetry. That's why they're massless degrees of freedom from a spontaneously broken global symmetry. Uh, so in particular, they enjoy a shift symmetry under the broken generators, and they transform in well-defined ways under the unbroken generators. Okay, so hopefully this is familiar. This is just the physics of gold stones coming from a spontaneously broken global symmetry. Now we wanna see, can we apply it to the standard model? Can we make the Higgs boson, right, a gold stone boson of a spontaneously broken global symmetry and use that shift symmetry to explain why the Higgs uh, is light? Because if the Higgs enjoys a shift symmetry when its mass is taken to zero, then the Higgs mass parameter has become a technically natural one. Okay, so let's try it. So here's a toy model. So instead of SUN N minus one, let's take SU3 and spontaneously break it to SU2. Okay, so now we can parameterize our gold stones and suggestively, right, the gold stones that transform as a fundamental under the unbroken SU2, I'm gonna call them all collectively H, right? So in particular, I get one singlet gold stone that I'm gonna ignore for the rest of this discussion and I get one complex scalar that transforms as a doublet under the unbroken SU2 and has a shift symmetry under the broken generators. Okay, so we'd like to identify that with the Higgs, right? If we identify that with the Higgs, then the unbroken SU2, for example, we can imagine associating with SU2 weak, SU2 left, and the Higgs now transforms as a doublet under SU2 left. Okay, so so far so good, right? We've written down a simple pattern of symmetry breaking where we can pick out the Higgses as being Goldstone bosons that transform as a doublet under SU2. Now, um, the theory of the Goldstone bosons, of course, is a little complicated, right? So if I started with my original theory of that scalar phi that breaks SU3 to SU2, 
And then I expand out and I look, what are all the interactions I get for, say, the Higgs doublet as a goldstone? Well, I get uh, kinetic terms for the Higgs, and then I get various um, higher terms that are irrelevant operators that just come from expanding out the exponential of these goldstones, right? So I have an infinite tower of higher dimensional operators. They're all suppressed by the scale f. So one of the leading ones, for example, is one that has h dagger h out in front of a kinetic term for the Higgs, but that's suppressed by 1 over f relative to the leading kinetic term. And then I have a whole tower of higher derivative operators that come from expanding out the exponential of these fields. Now, this is a non-normalizable theory. Um, so one thing we can ask anytime you have a non-normalizable theory, again, is what is your power counting, right? Where, in what range of your theory is this description valid? And so you can go ahead and ask, well, uh, here's my leading term, which gives me a kinetic term for the Higgses. Here's an irrelevant operator. All right, this is going to give me some loop diagrams that renormalize my leading kinetic term. If I want to have a well-defined power counting, in other words, if I want to be able to ignore even higher operators, it had better be that those loop corrections don't swamp the leading classical piece. So in particular, right, this leading term just gives me my normal two-point function for the Higgs. This next term, right, this gives me something that also gives me a two-point function, and then I close off this h dagger h into a loop, right? So this loop parametrically is, it's got a 1 over f squared in it, just from the coefficient here. It's got a 1 over 16 pi squared. Uh, and now this loop has a quadratic divergence. And so if I just integrate it up to some cutoff, right, this is the natural size, dimensionless size of the contribution from this loop, which corrects the propagator. OK. So if I want consistent power counting, if I want to be able to ignore all of the higher operators that are suppressed by more powers of f, it had better be that I only use this description of the theory up to some cutoff that's less than about 4 pi times that scale f. Okay. So this is just... So the way I've written it, that order parameter is f, right? So this is just the statement, this is the funny, this is the statement that's true of chiral Lagrangians in general, right? That if I think of the order parameter of my symmetry breaking as being the scale f, that the actual cutoff of the theory of the Goldstones, uh, that the theory breaks down not at f, but actually a factor of 4 pi. So the same thing happens, of course, in the chiral Lagrangian. In fact, the same diagrams are the ones in the chiral Lagrangian. You can write down a theory of pions and kaons, for example, and you might think that the pions and kaons, that description, fails right around the mass of the pions and the kaons, but it doesn't. It actually is good until about a GeV, or at least somewhat closer to a GeV, and that's because of this factor of 4 pi. Okay, so yeah, here what you would think of is, um, well, he, so far I haven't committed to the actual details microscopically of what breaks the SU3, so there are lots of different things you could do, or all I really want to do right now is just write down the theory of the Goldstones and see what it does. Okay. Okay, good. So, so in particular, so here, yeah, good. So, so here what I've done is I've really started out actually with the renormalizable theory, right? Some scalar phi gets a VEV, breaks SU3 to SU2, okay? Uh, if it were actually a scalar, some elementary scalar that were doing it, then of course that scalar would have a hierarchy problem. So here I would have explained why I have a goldstone that's light with respect to the scale F, but the scale F now has a hierarchy problem, and so I need to somehow protect that. So, um, one thing that would happen is that maybe supersymmetry could come in to protect the scale f. Now then it would come in not necessarily at the weak scale, but whatever the scale f is. So we'll talk a little bit about where f might be, but f is probably not that far above the weak scale. f might be the TeV. So then extra stuff completing, protecting that scale from higher scales would have to come into the few TeV. The other possibility, the one that's more common, I haven't said the words yet, but they're implicit when you talk about global symmetries, is it could just be that uh, there's some strongly coupled physics that breaks the SU3. So there's no elementary scalar that breaks the SU3. It's just like a technicolor for the scale F instead of the scale V. So that would tell you that then there are strong coupling phenomena and there's really heavy resonances, you know, the, the moral equivalence of rows and other heavy excitations that would be showing up at the scale lambda, corresponding to some strongly coupled physics. But exactly where that is relative to the weak scale, we'll get to in a couple of slides. Okay. okay. Of course, uh, the Higgs in the standard model has to couple to other fields in the standard model, right? And uh, in particular, 
those couplings, if I just write them down, they break the SU3, right? If I just couple the Higgses to quarks, like I see in the standard model, or to electric gauge bosons, those aren't SU3 invariant. And any couplings, therefore, that uh, violate the SU3 explicitly, they uh, give radiative contributions to the Higgs mass that are not protected by the shift symmetry, right? This is just like uh, in my theory in the chiral Lagrangian, my pions, any of the couplings in the standard model that violate the global symmetries that protect the pions give me contributions to the pion masses. Okay. So, for example, if I write down the top Yukawa coupling to the Higgs, right, uh, that thing doesn't respect the full SU3. And so if I just write down you know, the UV sensitivity, what is the quadratic divergence, I get my normal quadratic divergence answer. So at this level, right, I've wasted my time. Right? I said, oh, the Higgs is a goldstone or a spontaneously broken SU3. But then the couplings of the standard model violate the SU3 explicitly, so I haven't protected myself from quadratic divergences. Do you have a question? Complaint? Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, so there's a natural solution, right? Anytime a model builder is confronted with a problem, they add an extra epicycle. Um, so what's the solution? Well, the solution is to extend the standard model, right? So that the fields of the standard model are parts of multiplets of a full SU3, and all of the couplings of those fields to the Higgs respect the full SU3 symmetry. Once I do that, right, once the couplings respect the full SU3, then they are, uh, they don't give, the, the Higgs is protected by the shift symmetry against any radiative contributions from those couplings. Okay, so for example, for the top quark coupling, right, just putting in top quark couplings broke the SU3, but now if I extend the top quark, all the, the left-handed tops and the right-handed tops, if I expand them to be multiplets of the full SU3, so I have to extend the left-handed quark doublet to be uh, a triplet of the global SU3, I also have to extend the right-handed top to have an extra right-handed top, all right? So if I extend the top quarks in this way, then I can write down a top Yukawa coupling that is SU3 symmetric, right? So if I write down an SU3 symmetric top Yukawa coupling, so this is the natural coupling I can write down. In the UV, it comes from the scalar phi, coupling, say, to this SU3 triplet of quarks, and then coupling to the two right-handed quarks. Now, I would expect, if the Higgs is a goldstone of spontaneously broken SU3, because this is an SU3 symmetric coupling, it won't give any contributions to the Higgs mass. All right, that's my expectation. So we can go see how it works out. This is the slightly boring part. Uh, so, you know, we go, phi gets a vacuum expectation value, it breaks the SU3, we write down the low energy theory of the pions, breaking SU3 gives a mass term that pairs up some of the top multiplets, it gives me something that starts to look like a top Yukawa coupling, and it gives me a funny set of irrelevant interactions that just come from expanding out the exponential with the Higgses, right? So this looks like some crazy uh, irrelevant interaction, but its couplings and coefficients are fixed by the fact that the Higgs is a goldstone. Okay, so these are the interactions that I get. I have to rotate to the mass eigenbasis. That's a simple thing to do. In terms of the mass eigenstates, what we see is we see the Higgs coupling with what looks like a top Yukawa coupling to a normal left-handed quark doublet and a right-handed quark. It also picks up an interesting coupling to the other right-handed quark multiplet. And then it gets this interesting irrelevant coupling now to the new quarks, the ones that are required to fill out full SU3 multiplets. Okay. So now I can see in this low energy effective theory, I can see the same thing that happened in supersymmetry, right? If I've extended the couplings of the standard model to be SU3 symmetric, they shouldn't give any UV sensitivity to the Higgs, right? If the Higgs is a goldstone of broken SU3. And I should be able to see that through a cancellation of the quadratic divergences. That tells me that I'm not getting any UV sensitivity from these couplings. So I see that exactly in this theory. So I get what I would think of as my normal quadratic divergence from the Goldstone-Higgs coupling to normal top quarks, right? There's an extra diagram, oopsie, there's an extra diagram coming from the second coupling involving the extra heavy right-handed top quark. And now there's this very funny looking diagram, right, that comes from the irrelevant operator. The sign of this diagram is flipped relative to these, not because of opposite statistics, right? That's what happened for supersymmetry. It's flipped because the sign was flipped here because the Higgs is a goldstone and the relative sign is fixed by expanding out the exponential, okay? So these diagrams now have exactly the right signs and coefficients to cancel the quadratic divergences. So the Higgs, again, has no UV sensitivity coming through loops of the top quark because I extended the top quark to be part of a full SU3 multiple. All right, so hopefully that makes clear to you, right, how this is working. It's exactly like supersymmetry. We've extended the theory now to have a global symmetry now the Higgs is protected uh, by shift symmetry because it's a goldstone of spontaneous breaking of that symmetry. 
But to extend that to the rest of the standard model involves adding lots of new partner particles that are related to their standard model counterparts by the global symmetry. All right. So you can now play the same game that you play for supersymmetry. You can ask, you know, these particles all give finite contributions to the Higgs mass. So you can ask where they have to be in order not to have those finite contributions be too large. The answer is comparable. There are a few subtleties. One is that uh, in a theory, um, so when we wrote down the theory, there's nothing that connected the scale F to the scale of electric symmetry breaking. But when you work out all of the finite radiative corrections, you actually find that there's basically a relation that tells you either the scale F is within a loop factor of the weak scale, or in fact it wants to be very close numerically, and you can only push it apart with a little bit of tuning. So the scale F, to answer your question, it can't really be much more than a loop factor above the weak scale. Uh, typically, it's actually quite a bit closer. And that tells you, really, the degrees of freedom associated with this extended symmetry. They're actually showing up in exactly the same place where superpartners are showing up. Right? Their mass also came in at one loop. Here, the mass is coming at one loop. Nothing can be much heavier than a TeV. Okay. There's a further extra interesting uh, thing that happens in these theories that are different from supersymmetry, which is that because the Higgs is a Goldstone boson, it has these funny extra irrelevant operators that come from the exponential expansion. And that actually has an interesting impact on Higgs properties. Okay? So if I have a theory where I have a leading kinetic term for the Higgs, plus I have this irrelevant operator because the Higgs is a Goldstone, now when the Higgs gets a vacuum expectation value and breaks electric symmetry, this extra term gives something that looks like a shift in the canonically normalized kinetic term of the physical Higgs scalar, okay? So of course, what do we do anytime we have some term in front of a kinetic term? We redefine our fields to get canonically normalized fields. So we can get, out, get rid of this term by be changing the normalization of the Higgs. But that means this factor then shows up in all of the Higgs couplings to standard model fermions and gauge bosons. So it actually gives a uniform shift in all the Higgs couplings, okay, by the same amount. All right, so that tells you there actually will be Higgs coupling deviations. Higgs couplings will all be changed uniformly by the same amount that's proportional basically to the ratio of the weak scale relative to the scale F. So you also get to look for Higgs coupling deviations. That's a change in the global symmetry relative to supersymmetry. Okay, so far we haven't seen compelling evidence for this sort of shift. So that actually bounds the scale of V over F at about a factor of a third. Uh, that tells us that F has to be at least a factor of three higher than the weak scale. All right. And then we go, much like we look for supersymmetry, we look for these fermionic tar partners. Uh, they're produced in much the same way as their scalar counterparts. They decay slightly differently. Again, we haven't seen any evidence for them, and bounds on these guys are also pushing past the TeV scale. So hopefully I've set up this parallelism in a way that's clear to you, right? Although global symmetry and supersymmetry, they are different tribes in physics beyond the standard model, they're basically working in the same way to explain why we have a light Higgs. They have very analogous sets of predictions. They all predict new partner particles near a TeV scale, and so far we have yet to find evidence for any of them. We also, of course, in the global symmetry case, we also can look for partners of the Ws and Zs, these heavy resonances. We also don't see those, so it pushes out the limits as well. Okay. So um, what I've tried to communicate to you in this lecture is uh, if we want to solve the hierarchy problem, the most suggestive way of doing it is to extend the standard model in a way that makes the Higgs mass a technically natural parameter. And we can do it with supersymmetry, we can do it with global symmetries. They both work in very analogous ways. They both predict new partner particles. They both give finite corrections to the Higgs mass that tell us those partner particles can't be too far from the weak scale. And experimentalists have gone out and looked for these uh, very strenuously, and so far we have absolutely no evidence for what's going on. So this is a case, either of these things could be around the corner. We could discover evidence for these new particles uh, tomorrow. But um, the problem is none of the states have shown up in exactly where we expected them to be, and the fact that all we have are null results are starting to make these theories finely tuned, at least something that's approaching the percent level. So um, there are two things you could take away from this, right? One message you could take away is maybe this is not the way, maybe the hierarchy problem is not solved, maybe it is fine tuning, maybe it's anthropics, maybe there's nothing we should expect to see near the weak scale. But as young people who are at the start of your career, what you should really ask, right, is uh, we had these ideas that have dominated how we think about physics beyond the standard model for the last 30 or 40 years. It's taken us 30 or 40 years to get an experiment powerful enough to test those ideas. So far, the favorite ideas, the winning paradigms, haven't shown up. So uh, we can still work on them, we should still work on them, but the other thing to think about is maybe there are other ideas that lie outside the scope of those dominant paradigms. And uh, 
Maybe we're something close to the beginning of a paradigm shift. Maybe there are new ideas that we can think about that would address the problem. The problem is real. Hopefully, you at least somewhat believe that the hierarchy problem is a real problem. Uh, but maybe the solutions to it are different from the ones that we've been pursuing historically. So that's all I wanted to say today. Thank you very much for your endurance through this doubled set of lectures. And I'll see you more tomorrow morning. <laughs>